Hello and welcome to The Kitchen Life. The Kitchen Life is all about fewer ingredients, simple recipes, surefire techniques, and passionate cooking. I'm your host, Chef Jonathan Collins, and I've got some great recipes for you today. These two recipes are going to be side dishes. They're going to be go-to dishes for you, and they use some of my favorite vegetables. I've got turnips, these beautiful little babies. Maybe you pass by them in the uh, grocer's aisle, but today I'm going to show you how to make this protein very simple. I'm going to be doing a turnip and spinach gratin. So this turnip and spinach gratin takes the flavors of both these vegetables. It takes all the nutrients and all the flavors and it blends to get them together in a beautiful dish. Then we're going to be doing a quiche and that quiche is going to be broccoli and gouda. So I've got one of my favorite cheeses which is gouda. It's a Dutch cheese, very mild, but when it melts, oh my goodness, is it ever delicious. The first thing I'm going to show you today is the short crust. So this crust for the quiche, I want to do it first because it has to rest in the freezer after I make it. It comes together extremely simple. So in just a moment, I'm going to show you how to do that. But this uh, broadcast today is brought to you by Produce Made Simple. And one of the things that I love about Produce Made Simple is you can go to that website, producemadesimple.ca, and you can find any vegetable or fruit that you found in your grocery aisle or the local market. You can go there, type in that name, and you will find a recipe that will complement it beautifully. So without further ado, let's get started with this uh, short crust. The first thing we're going to do is start with a food processor. So uh, you can use your hands if you want. You can use a cutting tool and cut it in. But I'm going to show you how easy the food processor makes it. It's incredible how simple it is. So I'll start with uh, two cups of all-purpose flour. It's really important when you're doing recipes for pastry to make certain to measure it exactly. So this is just a straight all-purpose flour. The nice thing about these ingredients are that it's ingredients that you've got at home. They're inexpensive ingredients, easily and readily available, so there's no trouble in, uh, in getting them. Then I've got some flaked sea salt. Now you can use, just use regular salt. If you have the choice when you're going out, this is a salt I love. Check out some flaked sea salt. I love the texture, I love the flavor, and, uh, and it's great too. The next thing is, in the refrigerator, I've got 10 tablespoons of butter chilling. Now, just a little side note, just so that you know, I'm going to grab a pound of butter. So a regular pound of butter in your, uh, from the grocery, so it's uh, 454 grams or a pound. But if this is divided by four, each one of those little sticks is eight tablespoons. So when you're making this recipe, what I've done is I've divided into 10 tablespoons. So it's one stick and a half. And the reason that I cube it up is as it gets tossed around inside the food processor, it cuts together much more simple. Now, how about we get a little bit of a close up on this? We'll put this butter into our Roboku. And then I want to show you how close it is. There's two steps here that I want to show you how easy it is, but how it comes together so very quickly. So with the lid on, the next step is to pulse. So all food processors, uh, this Cuisinart uh, in particular, has a pulse function. I'm going to pulse it 12 times. So, And what pulsing does is it tosses all those ingredients up, and then they fall back down, and when they do, it allows it to incorporate more accurately and more completely. So each time I pulse, the other thing, I, I, the reason I'm using frozen or chilled butter is as I work with the butter, its nature is to want to go together at uh, kind of to become almost like a liquid state. Let's have a look at this. I want to show you the texture you're looking for. Come on in here and I'll show you. So if you look at that, that's the texture of sand. So the French term for this is sable, which is just simply sand. But this is the texture you're looking for. Nothing more, nothing less. And then this is the fun part. You can stay tight there because I want to show you this. So I've got ice water prepared. Remember, all the ingredients that are in here right now is just all-purpose flour, two cups. Uh, 10 tablespoons of chilled butter and a little pinch of salt. And now I've got ice water. So I'm going to start by turning my machine on. 
and then I'm very slowly just going to pour a little bit at a time. And the reason I just want a little bit is I want very much moisture. I have to uh, blind bake these or par bake them before I use them. So the, the least amount of water, the better the consistency will be. The reason I'm using ice water is I want to keep that butter chilled. I want to keep it cold so that the consistency is just right. I can see that's just about come together now. Look at that. So you know it's done when it pulls together like that and off. So that's the consistency. I'm going to show you this up close. I want you to get this because this is a source of frustration for a lot of people. Imagine now uh, making your own crust and how simple that is. You just take a little bit of uh, plastic wrap here. So it's important to have the plastic wrap. And we'll turn this dough out. Now let's have a look at what this looks like. Let's set that aside. And I'm just gonna bring that together. It feels great. The texture is quite nice. Any of those little bits, watch. I'm just gonna pick them up like this. Perfect. And then I'm just gently gonna just kind of fold this just so the composition is complete. So it's nice and soft and round. I really don't want to overwork that. And this is also the fun part. Kids love this. I'm telling you, this is something fun to bake with kids. I'm just going to turn over each side of this and then fold in the plastic wrap. I'll turn that over. And then I've got my rolling pin. I'm just going to give that a slight roll. The closer you can get this disc to its finished size, the better it will be. The reason is that um, this is a delicate pastry. So there's not a lot of gluten here. You've got, uh, you know, there's no, no development yet. So all that's really holding it together is some butter and that liquid. So that's what you're left with, that disc. And so I'm gonna put that in the freezer and I've got one in the freezer. Now, when you're ready to work with it, it's important to bring it out of the freezer, you know, about maybe 10 to 15 minutes before you're ready to work with it. So this has fully rested, it's solid. So I'm gonna take that, sit that up here on the marble and I'll just let that begin to come up to room temperature. So that is the simple base for this beautiful quiche. Um, for me, the combination of broccoli, these crowns of broccoli are just spectacular. Um, they, they're full of flavor and that combined with that beautiful Gouda cheese is going to be a rich dish. The nice thing is this can be prepared a couple days in advance and be served over several days in the refrigerator, but food safe, heated up or chilled, it's going to be a huge hit. Now, the great thing about wherever you're watching this right now, we're streaming live to about a dozen locations. You can ask questions. So if you've got anything you want to ask me, now is a great time, all during this broadcast. And I'll tell you what, even when the broadcast is over, we'll be watching for questions. So I'm here for you. your job in the kitchen, the kitchen life, that much simpler. So the next thing I want to do is I want to start, let's get a close up on this finished dish. So this is, now I've transformed the turnip and spinach into this beautiful turnip and spinach gratin. The nice thing about this dish for me is it's absolute, it's simplicity. So I'm going to start with yellow onions um, with the, uh, I've got an induction burner here, which is great. Um, I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to put it on about four. Just start to preheat it, so about medium heat. Uh, and then the preparation for the onions is quite simple. Literally going to trim the top, trim the root. One thing I always have going is I've got a, a bowl where I put all the trimmings. Makes the job easier in the kitchen. Peel that outside off. I'm going to do this on three beautiful uh, yellow onions. So yellow onions, obviously, um, there's lots of sweetness. Of course, everybody loves caramelized onions. And what they do, if you put them in raw, they have a good flavor, but they are just asking to have this flavor developed. Um, and the way that we're going to develop the flavor today is using a technique called saute. Now, saute literally means to jump out of the pan. 
We know it's going to be a hot uh, cooking method. We also know something else. It's going to be adding flavor. And the way that it does that is by getting rid of liquid and concentrating natural sugars. Um, one of the things that's a hallmark of saute is to not cover it. So if I was to cover a saute pan with the onions in, I wouldn't have the steam escaping. The steam would stay in and I would end up, I'd still end up with some pretty tasty onions, but they're not going to have the same consistency as when I saute. So with the top and bottom trimmed, I'm not going to slice, um, I'm going to slice in line with top to bottom. The reason I'm specifically paying attention to how I'm slicing it is just purely because I want nice long pieces. This slice is called julienne. Now this will make nice bite-sized pieces. You won't have any long stringy pieces. So easy preparation. If you have a food processor, of course, you can do this slicing in your food processor. I'm using a uh, chef's knife, an eight inch uh, chef's knife. The chef's knife makes this job really easy. One thing about preparation in the kitchen, make sure to have a good sharp knife. The comment I always get about onions is how are you not crying through this whole process? And a good sharp knife will do a great deal to uh, prevent any weeping. Yep. Uh, Yeah, no problem. Thanks for watching and thanks for commenting. Uh, we certainly do appreciate it. Uh, it's been, uh, the holidays are a, a busy time of year. So the reason I like things like this is that they can be done ahead of time. If we have a look very quickly down at this finished dish, this dish will actually improve with time. So if this is made the day or even two days before, make sure to cover it up completely, but you bring that back up to temperature in an oven, you're gonna be, and your guests are gonna be very happy. So I'm gonna take about a good tablespoon of butter in the pan. I'm gonna let that become a little bit fragrant, and then I'm just gonna put a little bit of olive oil in. These flavors go just great together. Onions are going in the pan. And remember, take your time with this. It'll go very quickly. But take the time, get the cuts right. And if you follow these simple steps, you'll find that this recipe will be easy for you to execute. And let's face it, any recipe that's easy to do, you're going to love. So with the onions frying away, I want to talk to you a bit about seasoning. Seasoning at this point is really important. So again, back with the salt. You'll use less if you do it in layers as you're cooking. So salt and pepper. And the nice thing about onions is I don't really have to babysit them. The best thing to do with onions is to wait for the fragrance. Wait for that beautiful aroma of caramelized onions. That will tell me if I keep tossing it over and tossing it over, that's gonna keep turning it and, and I won't get the caramelization I'm looking for. I wanna leave it for a minute now and then we'll toss it up. So what I did with the turnips, now I gave some serious consideration to how to look at this. For me, turnips are, and just before I do that, let's talk about uh, a common uh, mistake that's made sometimes at the market or in a grocery store. So turnips can grow to be almost the size of a rutabaga. Now a rutabaga is good roasted, it's good uh, raw, there's so many different applications. This makes soups sing and it has a waxy coating that the turnip does not have. But let me tell you something, the difference, so I always remember it like this. You know that this is a rutabaga and this is a turnip because most of the time it's bigger. So the ruta is bigger. Get it? Ruta, bigger. They told me not to tell that joke. I think it's a good one. Remember, the rutabaga, it's bigger. It's generally always bigger. But even if they are the same size, you can see there's a definite difference. Um, this is quite firm. 
very hard, always with the wax coating, and the turnips, whether they're these nice smaller ones or larger ones, uh, they're going to have the same flavor, same texture. I like these because the way I'm going to cut them right now, they are going to be uh, like bite-sized pieces. And I don't want to mash this up. I don't want to cube it up. I want this to have a rustic beauty to it. So I'll show you all I want to do. So they have this distinct purple, this bright purple on the outside. And I thought to myself, I really don't want to get rid of that, that flavor. So I tested it both ways, peeled and unpeeled. I liked it better peeled. So what I'm going to do is just trim the tops. We don't have to waste very much at all. Just trim the tops of these beauties. The nice thing is uh, you can use uh, the turnip and honestly, some people at your table will have never tried it before. So let's have a look. I'm kind of, these are starting to come up nice. Look at that. We're starting to get a little bit of caramelization. That's what I'm looking for. for. I want them, yes, I want them to become, become translucent, to start to render down, but I really want that flavor because it's the only time I can really get that flavor into this dish. I need to do it now, otherwise there's no way to add flavor later on. Then with the uh, turnips, I'm just going to take, and the nice thing about doing it this way, if you slice that top, it's very stable. I can sit it on the board, and with little to no effort, I can pass these through. And all I'm doing with this size is quartering them. If they were much smaller, you might, or I'm doing this by eight rather, if uh, they were much smaller, you may want to do them uh, in, in only quarters. And, you know, if they get bigger, you can do them by 16s. Uh, the point is, you know, not to make them too big, one bite or two bite, so that if somebody has it on the plate, they don't have to struggle with it, they don't have to fuss with it. I want to thank you for watching The Kitchen Life today. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions. Uh, and if you know anybody that would like this broadcast, it'd be great for you to tag a friend, let them know about The Kitchen Life. Um, we uh, broadcast The Kitchen Life here live from my family farm. And uh, we've got a lot of exciting things in store. In 2018, we'll be cooking from the barbecue, cooking from the kitchen, cooking from the garden, um, sharing all kinds of recipes with you, and uh, just helping, th helping you uh, uh, make things simpler in the kitchen. So with these divided up, you can see about the time it takes me to prep each thing. I'm getting things ready in steps here, and it's a good chronological order for you uh, to be able to prepare the uh, dishes in. The next thing I've got is I've got the dish. So you could use a casserole. Uh, you could do this in a frying pan. What I have is a cast iron casserole. I like to mix things up. I use porcelain. <clears throat> I use cast iron. Excuse me. And in this case with the cast iron, even though it's already seasoned, what I'm doing right now is I'm just going to put a little bit of oil in there. I'm going to put it on the sides. There's two things that this olive oil is going to do. It's going to add flavor to the dish. It's also going to prevent anything from sticking. I'm going to be using cream. So I want to make sure that that uh, just comes out of there beautifully and I can serve it to perfection. Perfect. So uh, one of the things, while I'm sautéing this for just a moment, um, I'm going to get to the, uh, to the greens in just a second. But I want to show you uh, on Produce Made Simple how this website works and why it's so important to me uh, for you to check it out. So ProduceMadeSimple.ca, um, by the way, we have a, a broadcast uh, from a couple weeks or a week ago with some beautiful uh, desserts. If you didn't have a chance to see it, you can watch it right here. We've got it up here on the screen now. Um, so Produce Made Simple, you can go through and find any recipe you need. Um, literally, you're walking the aisles, you see a, a fruit or a vegetable that you haven't seen before. <clears throat> You can not only find a good recipe here, and it'll show you, you know, you can print the recipe, you can watch the how-to videos, you can share it with friends, but you can also uh, find anything, but you can also archive it for yourself as well. They become uh, recipes that you use time and again. I know myself, before we do recipes, uh, we prove them at least three or four times, making sure that they're right. 
Uh, the other thing you can do is you not only learn about the recipes, but you also learn about the fruits and vegetables themselves, where they're grown, how they're stored, and any of those questions, Produce Made Simple is the place to go. So this is the point, especially now, so I'm doing this live broadcast. What I'd really like to do is put these onions in the pan and move on to the next thing. But this brings up a really good teaching point. This is the point at which in the kitchen where panic sometimes sets in. Sometimes you feel the pressure, I gotta keep going. But if you wanna make exceptional food, you have to be patient. You have to give it the time that it needs in order to develop flavors. And that's really what we're doing. Doesn't matter what the recipe is, each ingredient needs development. What a chef is and what you are as a home cook is you are developing the flavors, whether it's spinach or turnips, the rutabaga or uh, eggs, any one of these ingredients is nothing on its own, but together it makes a beautiful recipe and it's really important to wait that out. So what's happening here uh, is I'm losing water. So sauteing, again, uncovered, so that all of that moisture can escape. Let's have a quick look at this. You can see it very clearly there. As that moisture escapes, it's very easy to see what's happening. And let's see if we've got any, oh, we're starting to develop some nice color there. You can see that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and just set this uh, turnip aside for just a moment. The turnip is actually, I, when I was testing the recipe again this morning, the kids walked in, they said, what is in, that, uh, in the oven? They couldn't believe what it was. And of course, this is the best way to really get uh, kids to develop palates and to get kids into eating different foods is to find ways to make it, you know, putting in a gratin rather than boiling it or a kind of, you know, frankly, ruining it. This is a great way to be able to enjoy it uh, and, uh, and not turn somebody off an ingredient. Uh, I know, you know, we've all had the experience, maybe it's Brussels sprouts, let's say. Uh, you know, somebody steamed them or boiled them and you put them on a plate, they're kind of a terrible color of green and you taste it, the consistency's off, the flavor's off. Here what we're doing is we're developing each thing, paying attention to how we treat it so that it tastes beautiful. So what I've got is I've got, uh, so this is uh, spinach. Um, so this is not baby spinach, this is actually about mid-size. So you have, you can get little baby spinach leaves. They would work fine for this recipe, be just as good. Spinach all taste, you know, the same. Uh, you can get much bigger spinach leaves. The larger the leaf, the bigger the stem and the rib on the inside. So because of the way I'm cooking this, all I want to do is I'm just going to take, these have been kind of jogged nicely, so I'm going to take, I'm going to remove those stems. Now, you might think, I'm, I'm actually not going to toss these. I'm going to use these in a soup and a puree later, so they don't become garbage. I just repurpose them for another uh, recipe. But for me, what I want is I want these beautiful leafy greens. Um, man, this is really starting to smell good. Let's, let's have another look at this now, Code. There, that's what I'm looking for. That nice flavor development, that is what I'm looking for. Nice, golden brown, all broken down. So I think what I'll do now is I've got enough, enough going on here. I'm gonna transfer these to the pan. I'll show you how easy this is. So the prepared pan, I'm just gonna gently roll these into the pan. And what's great about this is I'm not gonna wash this pan out. I'm not gonna start again, doesn't that look gorgeous? I'm just gonna make a layer of onion on the bottom there. Man, it smells good. So I'm gonna go with just a little bit more butter again. And if you don't wanna use butter, I understand. Uh, use olive oil uh, or use a, a camelina or canola oil. Uh, Frankly, if you want to really avoid the, the fats, you don't need very much uh, to saute this. So the next thing going in is the turnips. So these turnips are going to go into that hot pan. I got my oven calling to me here. Beautiful. And all oven calling to you is always a good thing. Uh, so remember again the principle, a little bit of seasoning, and I do mean a little bit, a little bit of salt. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give these a little bit of a coat. If you don't wanna toss them like, uh, like I'm doing there, 
Uh, what you can do is just use a pair of tongs, move them around, make sure they're coated with that uh, fat, whatever you're using in the pan. And then I've got some fresh thyme. I love fresh thyme. And anything earthy like the, the root, so a turnip is a root. Um, this time of year in particular, it just absolutely loves it. So I'm gonna put some fresh thyme in. Uh, you know, great ways to get uh, flavor into recipes is the use of fresh herbs and spices. In this case, oh man, it smells so good already. Beautiful. So right now, if you happen to just be joining us, I'm working on a turnip and spinach gratin. Now gratin is just simply uh, talking about how it's finished. So you know, it's, notice it's nice and crispy and uh, gratiné or, uh, or broiled on the top. So what that, what that means is you're gonna have a ton of texture. So when you break down inside that gratin, it's gonna be creamy and rich on the inside, but you have that nice crisp crust on the top that's cheese and cream and some of these vegetables that have been nicely toasted. Um, now you could, sure, you could put all these ingredients just in a pan and roast them up and it would taste good. But the nice thing about doing this is you're layering them and you're layering the flavors and I love that. I'm just checking on that dough, it's, uh, it's just fine. So I'm sauteing these away. Now remember to preheat your oven, it's really important to preheat the oven. So 350 degrees in a convection oven. Make sure that the rack is placed in the center of the oven. You'll get better convection if it's placed in the center. Make sure it's fully preheated because all of our recipes are timed with a preheated oven. Really important to do that. Uh, as I was saying, you should definitely check out, if you have a little bit of a sweet tooth, check out our broadcast from last week on Produce Made Simple, where you'll find two recipes. Uh, one, I think, around here has collectively, I've made it again. It is now uh, kind of an all-time favorite. It's a ricotta cake with raspberries. It's absolutely phenomenal. So let's have a look in the pan here. I want to show you what we're looking at, what I'm looking for. This is starting to saute nicely now. Starting to get some nice color in here. And again, this is a point at which you don't want to uh, rush. Turn that up so you can see it. And I'll bring that in so you can see it. Nice. So now these are going to go into my pan. So you see what I'm doing here? I'm building these incredible flavors. Building all these beautiful ingredients together. And the nice thing, again, same pan. I don't have a whole bunch of pans on the stove, which means <clears throat> I don't have a whole bunch of pans in the uh, dish uh, sink either. So a little bit of butter one more time. Again, make sure that the fat, whatever you're using, butter or olive oil, make sure it comes up to temperature. And now we're just going to take the spinach and I'm just gonna slice this big bunch in half. That way, if the leaf does stay together, I'm not going to have a, a person where they're you know, taking a bite out of the spinach, and it's more like spaghetti, a great big long piece. I want to make sure it's bite-sized pieces. So you can see that pan is, is smoking nicely, and in goes the spinach. Oh, it's, as soon as it hits the pan, it just literally screams flavor. The color is beautiful, and one of the things you could do at this point is actually to cover it, and that's called wilting. And I've got a hot enough pan here that what I want is I want that steam, that liquid, to escape very quickly. So I'll just stay with it and make sure that it's all in the pan. I'll turn it over once. Once again, here we go, a little bit of seasoning, so a tiny little bit of salt. Of course, salt will bring out some of the uh, liquid and a little bit of pepper. And the key with spinach when you're cooking it for a recipe like this is to make absolutely certain to get all the liquid out of the spinach. So when you get the liquid out of the spinach, it means that I, it doesn't have to escape from the, the casserole. It's also concentrating those flavors. So as all of these, let's, let's have a quick look at this. You can see, I want you to see the different kind of phases of sauteing or wilting spinach. So 
When I started, the volume was here. And it's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. You can see that liquid, and that's concentrating flavor. So I'm just going to continue to reduce that and reduce that and reduce that until it's almost dry in its consistency. And believe me, it won't be dry when we're cooking it because we're going to light it up with that beautiful gouda and with the this uh, and with the cream as well. So the gouda cheese is, as I said, it's a very it's a very nice, soft kind of fragrant cheese. Uh, and I'm just going to take and peel. I've been eating this for a long time. So my uh, my mom's uh, mom and dad were from Holland. So I ate a lot of Gouda cheese growing up. So I'm just going to peel the outside off. And you can get this spiced. Uh, my Opa always had spiced. I like the spiced as well. It's good for this application. Uh, you can see that's coming up nicely. Now, you could shred this. But what I want to do is I essentially want to make ribbons of this. So this is going to be for my, uh, my broccoli and cheese. So I'll come to that in a minute so we don't confuse the two. Um, and I'll finish this one so we have it completely done. Now, if you're just joining us, I already started the quiche, and I did that by starting with the dough. Now, I put one, the one I prepared, in the freezer. This one I've got coming up to just room temperature. And then I'm holding on that recipe, shifting to this beautiful one where I'm using spinach and I'm using beautiful turnip. Now, behind the scenes here, I have my, my family. So if you hear me talking to Dakota or Bailey or Megan, they're part of my team today. Uh, if you have any questions, by all means, uh, let me know. We're monitoring all the different channels. Uh, and if you have any questions afterwards, you can just simply send it to info at collinscuisine.com and we'll be sure to answer you. Get your, uh, get your responses uh, back as soon as we can. Uh, if you have any questions, even over the holiday season, if you have any holiday emergencies, you know who to email. So this now is what I am looking for. I'm going to bring this up so you can have a look at it. I've sauteed that until it is virtually dry. Now, that's really important. Now, you may hear me say time and again, uh, repeating myself here on The Kitchen Life, but that's because I understand it takes over seven times hearing something for you to commit it to memory. And I really want you to commit these uh, techniques to memory. Now, this is that point at which I'm just going to take my time. I'm going to arrange this. Look, are you looking at this? Look at these gorgeous ingredients. I wish you could smell this because smelling the ingredients is such an important part of enjoying them. But looking at the color, so because you have these bright, incredible colors, and you have, you know, you have the turnips kind of poking out, you've got these, this beautiful spinach is weighed, it's just crying to be eaten, I'm telling you right now. It's just crying to be eaten right now. And all that, almost no liquid, literally like maybe half a teaspoon. And now comes the fun part for me. So one of my other favorite cheeses is uh, Parmesan cheese. It's a, it's a hard cheese or a firm cheese. You can see I'm just gonna rain that down on. The thing I like about using the microplane with refrigerated parm uh, is that you can get nice ribbons, get good even distribution, uh, no big chunks, and it's kind of delicate. So I like it for those reasons. Looks like uh, it's snowing on this dish. And then I've got cream. So this cream, I'm just going to take and strategically pour around. Man, it looks good already. So the nice thing about cream is, unlike milk, it won't scald when you're cooking with it. Um, it will concentrate. It will reduce. And what you're, what you're left with is a... Uh, is a very deep, very rich finish. Uh, so I'm gonna just top this up with a bit more cheese. And this is gonna go into the oven for a good 50 to 60 minutes uncovered. Um, you'll know it's finished when it's fragrant, when it's golden brown. And the most important thing is to make sure to test the turnip. And all you do is just take and pass a sharp knife 
into one of the pieces of turnip. When it passes through cleanly and comes out easily, you know that that's fully cooked. Of course, the turnip is the thing that'll take the longest to cook. So let's have a look at what the finish is. This is the finish of this dish. Um, it's creamy, it's rich, it's tender, um, and it is a great nutritious way to use beautiful produce. Now, I've got a dish I'm going to bring out and share with you. This one's cooled off enough here. I'll sit it here. So this is, this is the quiche. And this is what we're going to work on right now. So it's broccoli. It's gouda. It's, it's, a, it's a really nice combination of flavors that are both rich and and also very fresh. So the flavor of uh, broccoli is, uh, is very bright. Um, when you eat it raw, of course, there's a nice crunch, great flavor. But again, what we're going to do with it is we are going to, we're going to saute it. And by sauteing it, we're going to develop some flavor. So let's get started on that recipe. Um, the first thing I want to do, I'm going to test and see if this is, that dough feels like it's just pliable enough that I can work on it. What I'll do is I'm just going to get some uh, shallots on. I'm doing the same thing. I'm trimming the top and bottom. And then uh, and I'm going to do the same treatment as the yellow onions. Slice them to make sure that they're all uniform size. Uh, shallots are very nice because uh, they're very fragrant. Uh, you know, in just a few shallots, they pack a huge flavor punch. Uh, there's tons of flavor in shallots, and I always have them on hand. The nice thing about all of these ingredients today is they hold very well in the refrigerator, in their raw state, and after they're cooked. And that means a lot to me as well because that's simple. I know around my house, people are always looking for food. So if you have a leftover you can heat up, that's perfect. Yes, Bailey, question? Uh, Nicole said, do you use 35% cream or can you use a lower fat version? Do you need to use cream or would it be come out being healthy if you're using a higher fat flavor? So, uh, great question, Nicole. Thank you. A bechamel as a base uses butter and flour, uh, and then you can use milk. So one milk to uh, 75 grams of butter and 75 grams of flour. Now, a bechamel is, uh, in terms of uh, health, uh, has less fat uh, than 35% cream. We're using 35% cream here. Um, and it will have essentially the same results. Um, a little bit more time involved in the bechamel, uh, but a bechamel is one of the base sauces. I love bechamel. Um, I would say the fat content is slightly less with the bechamel. Uh, the taste, it's, it's going to taste a little bit better with the 35% cream. So if you want to replace the 35% cream with uh, something that's a little lighter, here's the recipe. Uh, bechamel is very simply butter and flour together in a pan, melted and, and whisked until fragrant. Then put in one liter of milk. Turn the heat down, whisk that, and as that begins to thicken, that will be your bechamel. A little bit of salt and pepper and a little pinch of nutmeg if you'd like, um, but that will make a great base for this as well. Great question, Nicole. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching The Kitchen Life. Um, I'm going to turn my uh, <laughs> pan back on, uh, and I'll just slice these up. So. You'll notice each time that I go to do an action, I make sure in this case, before I started uh, slicing, turn the pan on so it's ready to go for me. I don't want to put uh, any product into the pan cold. I want to make sure that it's roaring and ready to go. I was very fortunate enough to get these beautiful crowns of uh, broccoli. Um, I love the, uh, the tops, the stems. The stems, of course, with broccoli are something very special because you have the broccoli flavor all the way through. So even though I'm going to be trimming this today, the whole broccoli, this, this part for me, um, in a lot of cases, as a matter of fact, uh, even in this case, so in a, in a, in a quiche, 
You typically want bite-sized pieces, so that's why I'm going to be trimming this today. Uh, but if I was going to roast these whole, I would simply, I would simply take that and literally just run my knife down the side like that and then split that. I love showing the whole profile of the broccoli because it's so beautiful. Yes, Bailey, another question. Uh, you could also use a lower fat cream uh, instead of 35%. You could use half and half. Um, the thing about uh, the half and half is uh, it won't give you quite the nice viscosity, the nice thickness, the nice richness that 35% will. It's the fat that's in the 35% that makes it so rich. And when you concentrate it, uh, it just tastes absolutely beautiful. So if you want to go lighter, use half and half. You could use uh, half and half in milk. And I'll tell you what, when we uh, upload these recipes uh, just after the broadcast, I'll make sure to put that lower fat option in to be able to use half and half and milk. Uh, we'll make sure to have that in there for you, Nicole. Thanks for watching. Great question. Okay. Oliver Barch says, I think you know what you're talking about, Seth. Oliver Barch. Okay, so quick, quick little uh, segue. I got to say uh, hello to uh, a great chef. Uh, Oliver, if you're, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, great chef and good friend. Uh, a man that I learned a lot in the kitchen uh, from. So uh, if he's uh, if he's taken five minutes to watch this, I am extremely extremely grateful, sir. Um, so a little bit of butter, a little bit of olive oil in the pan, and again, both I'm choosing butter and olive oil because of flavor profile, because the fat is what acts as a vehicle to be able to saute these ingredients. And so now I know the butter is bubbling. Uh, there's a little bit of smoke. Let's get that little bit of smoke coming from the pan. And in goes, here we go. Let's see a little bit of smoke coming from the pan. And in go the uh, shallots. Spread those out a little bit. Tiny little bit of seasoning. And I put the shallots in first because they'll take a little bit more time to prepare than the broccoli will. This is the trim for the broccoli. I'm going to take the crown and I'm literally just going to slice that crown off. This I'll save. This is perfect for soups. Slice the crown. And one of the things that happens quite easily is I'm left with these really great bite-sized pieces. Now, if they're a little bit too big, I simply take and split those up. I don't want anything too big. Nice bite size or two bite pieces. I love the smell of fresh broccoli. You know, it's interesting because uh, fresh ingredients can take you back to a, a time, uh, like a place, for example, like summertime, um, and they can transform you. Uh, recipes are transformative in terms of memories, too. I love the memories that great recipes make. And for me, uh, these two recipes uh, from Produce Made Simple Today focus on some really important things. Number one, nutrition. Number two, uh, cost. Availability. The simplicity of these two dishes. And just the, simple, just the fact that they're, it's readily available and easy to prepare. So let's do it one more time. Take the crown and slice it down. Again, that's going to be for broccoli soup. Don't want to waste anything. One thing about working in a professional kitchen is you will never, you'll never find any waste um, because that's your profit. And I'll tell you what, at home, that's where your profit lies too. Uh, so hang on to those leftovers, uh, turn them into, uh, turn them into soups, uh, and uh, make the very best of all these great, incredible ingredients. Um, I know for myself. Um, in season, it's so nice to buy locally, and out of season, you're always supporting uh, local farmers, and that's really important to me too. So with this all divided, all roughly the same size, um, you'll know if you've watched before, I, I always say the reason we're uh, cutting everything the same size, the reason the French cataloged and made a description for every cut is because they wanted consistency. And the reason you want consistency is for even cooking, even flavor, and so that everything has the same appearance as well. So these shallots are ready. Let's have a quick look there. Shallots are ready. They're nicely, lightly sauteed. Flavor has begun to develop. And now 
we're going to go in with the broccoli. So the broccoli goes in. And we'll just do a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. Just a little bit. I'm going to give those a quick toss. Again, if you don't want to toss them, just go ahead and get yourself a, a pair of tongs. Turn it over. Get them completely coated. Make sure that you have that beautiful uh, fragrant fat all over. And that'll just accelerate the saute. I'm going to turn the heat up now. The nice thing about broccoli is they can really take the heat. So I'm going to season this. Again, that's a little bit of pepper. There we go. And now I think we're probably ready. I'm going to move all of this and we're going to get our crust ready to par bake. Now par baking is really important because it allows you to use something that is almost completely liquid. Um, so when you put these ingredients in, let's have a quick look at this. Um, now this was another one of our test ones, so this last one's going to be a beauty. Um, when you put those wet ingredients in, what happens is it wants to make the bottom completely soggy. So when you par bake, you end up getting rid of as much moisture as absolutely possible, which is really important. So a little bit of flour. And we'll put that on the countertop. Again, we're just using the same all-purpose flour. And I know that this is ready. I, this is tactile. It's pliable. If I press on that, it's too hard. You want to wait just a little longer. And there's a little saving grace if, for some reason, it gets too soft. And that happens. It happens, it happens to all of us. If it gets too soft, just simply put that back into the freezer give it 10 or 15 minutes and then you can go ahead and begin again. As you can see I'm just going to turn this on 45s. I'm just working this into a nice shape here. Um, if it begins to crack heavily on you that's a good way. I'm going to give this uh, broccoli a little toss here. Oh man it smells so good. The shallots and broccoli are just honestly it's heavenly. I'm going to turn this over. Got a nice dough going here. Give yourself some space. So if it begins to crack really heavily at the edges, that's a sign that it is too cold still. And if you can't handle it and it becomes in your hands like um, it's not pliable, uh, then you have probably waited a little long. Maybe it got heated up on top of the uh, surface of the counter. Don't uh, get stressed out about it. Just simply put it back into the freezer and you'll be able to handle it again before you know it. Little side note here, I'm just thinking as I do this, um, great way to incorporate good flavor into a crust we can do it right now. I'm going to turn this down. Man, it smells good. Uh, you can take something like parm and you can just grate that right into the crust. Look at that. This is a great time to do it. Le levels of flavor. And I'm just going to roll that in. And now I'm going to make sure that this is just wide enough. And here's our technique. Roll this up, start on the edge, and just draw it back towards yourself. And literally just roll it right on the rolling pin. That will ensure that you can handle it. And I've got this pie plate. Of course, uh, you can use glass. Uh, I really do prefer a ceramic for this. And just simply roll that back out again. Perfect. And then we'll just tuck these sides down. This is a part where you just want to be kind of gentle. Remember our saying here at the Kitchen Life, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So if you just take your time here, this is a time where you just want to not rush it. Press into all of the sides. And you can, this is a time where you can decide, you know, how thick do I want this crust? Do I want this to be super light and delicate? Do I want to have something a little more rustic and thick? 
And for me, what I'd love to do um, is I just love to, I'll show you this technique and probably should stay tight here on this, uh, on the camera because I'm going to trim off just to about an inch overlapping. Inch overlapping. It's good there, good all the way around. It's different every time. So you take that extra and then what you do is you just kind of tuck it in behind just like this. <laughs> the, this dish does not need to be seasoned uh, because, of course, it has all that butter in there. So it's, it's definitely not going to stick. But great question. Thank you for asking. I love the questions. The questions are, uh, honestly, they're what I like more than anything. And then I just use, I hook my one finger on the edge and just go around the edge. And I just pull this alternating as I go around the dish just to give myself a really nice edge, nice little pattern, work my way around the edge, pressing that dough for a beautiful finish. The quiche is something that is, oh man, it smells good. So that is fully, fully ready. Let's have a look. I'm just going to show you what I'm looking for here. So we have like little char marks you see that that little char marks little grilled little bits of uh, shallot now this is the fun part okay so the way that I get this ready because I still have to par bake this actually I'll come back to this in just a second now if you have any let's say you have a hole so you've got a spot that just just didn't turn out right well this is why you hang on to this extra little bit because if you've got a spot, let's say like right here, you just kind of tuck it in, kind of massage it in there, tuck it under, and a little piece like that will cover all manner of sin. You can hide it so well. Look, there's another little piece. You can just fix that up, kind of massage it in. Oh, there we go. Okay, so important part now is we want to perforate that bottom. We want to perforate that right now lots of holes and the sides and what that will allow is for any of the moisture to escape so we want to get rid of as much moisture and just be left with this beautiful flaky crust so all the way around and then both ways on the bottom and if you don't happen to have uh, beans ceramic beans for blind baking so this is just a sheet of parchment paper i'll put that over top and all i'm going to do i've got some peas or some beans i'm just going to shake those put those on top good heavy weight and this is going to ensure that i don't have any bubbling or blistering in that finish i want to make sure i press that right to the edge You can use, this is wax paper actually, you can use parchment or wax paper, press right to the side. And I'm going to pop that in the oven and I'm going to blind bake that for about 20 minutes and then I'm going to remove the beans and I'm going to bake it until it's golden brown. So I'm going to pop that in and while I do, or when I do, I'm just going to check this, yep we're good. So that goes in the oven. And now it's time to finish up this beautiful, beautiful topping. So I've got the Gouda cheese. Now I could shred this, but what I want to, I want to show you is I'm just going to take strips of it and it'll work in a nice symmetrical fashion I, because I want that cheese to just be coating on top, bubbling on top. I want it to be incredibly fragrant and I want it to be creamy and rich. So I'm literally just going to wring this out. The cheese slicer gives me just perfect size slices, evenly portioned all the way around. Beautiful. And I've done it in the pan because what will happen is while I'm blind baking, this will melt quite nicely and it'll give me a perfect base that I can just gently slide off into that perfect pastry uh, when the time comes. Now, 
Now for the filling. So our filling for the pie crust is really simple, or for the uh, quiche is very simple. So I've got some uh, really nice eggs here. So we'll just go with six eggs. I'm still working on getting my chickens, by the way. One of the, uh, in the broadcast in the new year, will be out in the barn. And uh, my, my idea is I'll take the chicken, from, uh, the, uh, the eggs from the coop, and I'll make something right out there. There we go. And now what I've got is I got one cup of milk and one cup of cream. So this is a good balance of 35% cream and 2% milk. So uh, to Nicole's point earlier, this is a little lighter because of the addition of milk. And I'm going to whisk this up. Of course, uh, eggs, are, uh, eggs are God's perfect little... Uh, miracle in the kitchen and in baking whether it's savory savory or sweet i absolutely love eggs and then to finish that the last thing i want to show you is the chives so chives just have this beautiful relationship with eggs they love eggs chives are so fragrant and so beautiful they're bright and fresh and I just wanted to show you how to cut them uh, without having any struggle with them. So I'm uh, just going to clean my knife here very quickly. And so jog the chives together like this. Slice them in half. They jump around on you terribly. Jog those together. And then as you're passing with the knife, rather than chopping down on it, Make really sure, and I'll tell you what, I'm just going to freshen up this edge. If you have a sharpening steel, it's uh, really good to have along uh, as you're uh, cooking. Just makes it so that you can freshen up that edge. You have a nice sharp knife. And then what I'll do is run that knife along the edge, and you have all those beautiful little bits, and the, and the eggs just love it. If you're making scrambled eggs, Chives love scrambled eggs. So I'm going to put those right in. Oh man, it looks so good. And I'm going to start by pre seasoning this. We'll put a little bit of salt and a little bit of black pepper. There we go. So, with all of these ingredients finished, uh, all I need to do is simply take that blind baked pastry and let's have a quick walk through here. So I literally, when the pastry comes out, all I have to do with it at that point is put this in gently into the pan and then pour the mixture over top and bake it until it's golden brown. It'll take about 30 to 40 minutes. Now listen, the kitchen life, as I said when we opened, is all about fewer ingredients. And I know you saw that today. It's always four or five key ingredients plus a little bit of seasoning. It's all about simple recipes. So you've learned a lot of really great techniques today. We talked about saute. You learned how to make a really nice dough. We're baking a quiche. We're making a casserole. These are side dishes that are easy to make because often you have things like milk or cream around the house. You always have flour. So whatever vegetable you have, you can make a beautiful quiche and showcase it in there. Or, you know, for the, uh, this, uh, this beautiful gratin, you can imagine that any vegetable would just love that environment. So uh, it is with uh, great pleasure I just say thank you once again uh, for watching The Kitchen Life, for joining me today uh, here at our farm, uh, and uh, for being part of this, uh, this great story. Listen, from my family to yours, we wish you a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Um, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll see you in 2018. You can get these recipes in, uh, in a, about an hour on uh, ProduceMadeSimple.ca. You will love them.